And now I will begin with our opening talk for today, the biblical foundations of Christian libertarianism. For the remainder of this time, I want to give you an outline of my thoughts regarding the foundational reasons and biblical texts for why a conference like this exists in the first place. Uh, first off, I like to say at times that we're on a mission from God. Much like Jake and Elwood, uh, we, we, have a, we have a mission, and that mission is, is very simple. Uh, Christians often have a pretty distorted view of what government is, what government's purpose really is. And Christian libertarianism fundamentally is a way in which uh, what we're seeking to do is show how, the, how biblical principles can be applied uh, to libertarian principles and to, sit, and to show how those things jive together very well. Libertarianism, in my view, is the most, is the most consistent expression of Christian political thought. So fundamentally, that's what we're here for. We have some sort of intuition that the way things that we are, are typically taught are not quite right, but that what we find in the libertarian political philosophy seems to make, a, uh, make much sense with, with our uh, understanding of biblical principles as well. So what are some of the, of, of the ways in which uh, Christians can misconceive of how, of how government works and, and what its purpose is? I, I contend that there are at least four misconceptions for, uh, for how Christians typically approach um, politics. Uh, for one thing, Christianity does not, does not advocate socialism. Uh, con we do see in some cases some, some unusual texts in the Bible that might suggest to us something, uh, something contrary to this. Acts 2, for instance, we, in verses 42 through 47, we see that the believers there in the early church hold, were holding all things in common. In Acts 4.32, it even says that no one claimed possessions were their own. But even in Acts 5, shortly thereafter, when Ananias and Sapphira come to and lay a, a, an offering before the disciples' feet, it is presumed, even then, that they own what they are giving, that they are voluntarily giving that. Now, socialism, where the means of production are owned by the state, has no justification through this narrative. All, it, all that this narrative really suggests to us is that voluntary charity is a, is a, is a means by which we can help support our friends, our family, our church. It is, a, it is a fallacy to assume that just by appealing to the Acts narrative that we can justify a socialist-styled government. Moreover, and this is, I think, very, very critical, Christianity does not glorify violence and war. Now, this should be self-explanatory to us, but unfortunately for the modern church, it's not. We should always press the question with our fellow Christians of how supporting wholesale slaughter, war, and aggressive invasion of nations who've done nothing against us, or even dropping atomic bombs can possibly be consistent with the Christianity one finds in the New Testament. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace for a reason. His message of loving our enemies, praying for our persecutors, even turning the other cheek is clearly something that runs against uh, what often governments uh, choose to make their mission. Christian love really has extraordinary extension, and it's a, and it's a fallacy to think that, that the Bible, that New Testament Christianity in any way supports violence and war against others. In John 16, 33, we read uh, in, the, in the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And it's through the gospel that we can overcome violence and even war. Uh, another misconception that people hold is that Christianity does not advocate a theocratic state. It's not as if God has commanded us that because some states are bad, we just need to start a new one and then stock it with just the right people. In Matthew 20, uh, we read... We, we read a, 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 as Jesus is talking to a few of his disciples about who is to be the greatest, Jesus calls them together and says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Later, Jesus says in John 18, 36, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. Is that not a, is that not a telling statement 
about the nature of the kingdom of God. Nowhere in the Bible do Christians receive a mandate to monopolize and institutionalize any apparatus of violence, and that is fundamentally what the state ends up becoming. And in truth, leading right into the, into the next part, is that Christianity really contains no theory at all to justify statism. Now, contrary to what many people say as the basis of their starting theology of politics, uh, they tend to bring up Romans 13 or rendering to Caesar as this is how we are to, uh, to interact with the state. But contrary to that, the whole of Scripture, if you look at it in context, has very little positive things to say about the state, as we shall see in a moment. We don't want to rush too quickly uh, to conclusions from very limited data. So there are also, I would say, four connections... I would say, as to what brings libertarianism as a, into, into Christianity as being the consistent expression of our political thought. Here are a few connections that I see in some of the justifications that I would, I would line up. Uh, first off, Christianity reinforces a libertarian theory of property rights. Now, the Bible doesn't spell this out entirely, but it really shouldn't have to. It's a very obvious thing in many respects. The backdrop of all biblical law really shows a clear assumption of property rights in land, in person, and in possessions. Direct commands such as do not kill and do not steal are very simple, clear indicators that God takes aggression against person and property very seriously. And likewise, uh, I would say that the golden rule, in fact, is, a, is another indicator uh, that we are to treat others as the, in the way that we would want to be treated suggests that we ought to treat others person and property in that way as well. Uh, Christianity loves the free market and peaceful interaction. God's project on earth fundamentally is for His creation to flourish and to act in, in some manner independently, to be creative. The dominion mandate necessitates that humans cooperate in order to make this happen. Now, we are repeatedly admonished by God to be part of and to support our communities. But proper community can only occur when people can freely seek ways to work together and to satisfy each other's needs through useful work. God has left this very open to us, uh, to us humans in this world. We're, it's, he's left it very much open to His creatures to create on their own. And it's really dehumanizing to subvert this emergent order with central planning and institutionalized control. Christianity affirms that no one should receive special moral privileges of position. All throughout Scripture, God judges by the same moral standard, as we read in Psalm 96 even. No one, not a king, nor a prophet, not a soldier, nor a merchant, no one gets a pass because of their position. On the contrary, often some of these people are judged even more strictly because of the power that they have. God will, quote, give each, to each person according to what, is, what, to what he has done, for God does not show favoritism. That's in Romans chapter 2, verses 8 and verse 11. James t chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. In that particular passage, James is talking about the treatment of the poor, but it also runs the other direction, that if we show that certain people have special privileges because of the fact that they were, say, democratically elected or because they were born to the right people, special privilege is not, is not justified by God either. No one, no one gets a pass because they have a uniform or a mandate or a representative beside their name. God clearly also says that ends do not justify means. You don't get a pass because, well, you're just doing what's good for society or something like that. In Romans 3, chapter 8, we read, why not say, let us do evil that good may result? That con their condemnation, those who say such things, their condemnation is deserved. Christianity is just as concerned with, with their means, with means as, they are, as we are with our ends. Finally, Christianity says that the state is a rebellion against man's God-given nature and purpose. From these connections that we're already seeing and these misconceptions that people have already have had, we can begin to see that there is an antipathy building between the institution of the state and the Christian way of life. But what other examples do we have from Scripture about the state? What does, what does a, 
what does the Bible really say about st the state and, the, and government? I contend that there are a number of examples throughout Scripture that suggest that the way that, that, the way that we should view the state is not, any, is not positive at all. First off, let us go to Genesis chapter 10 and 11. I want to read this very briefly. Uh, in, chapter, in Genesis 11, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower of what, that the men were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. And that is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, the book of Genesis is a book about origins. No matter how you view it, whether it's pure history or whether there is, uh, are, are uh, non-historical aspects, this theological narrative sets the stage of the entire world. It set the stage for the Jewish people and teaches us a theology of why things are the way they are. In Genesis 10 and 11, this is a narrative that is full of symbols. And in, and in my view, and I think that this is well justified, the Tower of Babel really is the origin story of the state. And the story here begins shortly after the flood. The people have congregated together, potentially for mutual benefit and trade. God has commanded them again in the, in the wake of the flood to begin again in the task of spreading over the face of the earth. Now, there's a person named in chapter 10. His name is Nimrod. It is said that he is the first king of, uh, in fact, of, of Babylon. And that is, and that is in exactly where, uh, where Babel is. Babel is historical Babylon. Nimrod is actually called in most translations in, in chapter 10, a mighty hunter before the Lord. But another way to translate that word actually is a mighty rebel, and which actually makes more sense considering what happens next. They conspired in Babel to build this tower, that according to Genesis would reach to the heavens and symbolize their ability to be gods themselves. Josephus in the Antiquities indicates that Nimrod actually inspires this rebellion, naturally because he is the first king of Babel, and that they believed they could even attack heaven and avenge themselves against God for causing the great flood, indicating again that they would not become scattered in, in, uh, in verse 7. God, in order to, to punish but not destroy them, sent confusion by causing them to speak different languages. They scattered, partly fulfilling God's plan to spread humankind at this point. And on the plains of Shinar, the, the full kingdom of Babylon was built. Now remember, this is, uh, the, the kingdom of Babylon is consistently referenced throughout the Bible as an abomination. And, in, and I think the, the, the correct interpretation is to see Babylon throughout Scripture as representing human government. The incident ultimately brings to mind the words of Paul in the book of Romans in uh, chapter 1, verses 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And does that not sound like what the state ultimately does? The state it, it always begins as a usurpation of God's authority. Now, we often miss the symbols in this text. The tower is more than just a building. It is, a represent, it is representative of the collective of men who seek to displace God. Likewise, the bricks that are mentioned are also more than just building materials even. The text specifically says they rejected stones in order to build. Hebrew scholars have long said that, the, that stones in, in the Old Testament represent God's action of creating individuals. Stones have character on their own, and it takes craft to shape them. Bricks, however, are, represent a dissolution of individuality. And this actually comes into play in the next narrative that we will examine, the book of Exodus. Carlton Heston joins us for this remark. <laughs> <laughs> 
Exodus 1 through 15 represents perhaps the greatest narrative in the Old Testament, that of the liberation of God's people. And in fact, it is a type in many respects of what happens in the New Testament, where Jesus liberates humankind from all sin. But it's significant to see what are they liberated from and what is going on at the time. When we find the Hebrew people in slavery in Exodus, uh, the early chapters of Exodus, what are they doing? For the most part, they're building bricks. This is, again, a connection back to, uh, to Genesis chapter 11 as well. What Egypt is doing in enslaving them, and this is what happens in any state that, that attempts to oppress its people, is that they try very hard to dissolve their individuality. God's plan for everyone is to be able to flourish, to be able to become the person that God intended them to be. That cannot happen when people are in bondage like that. What we find in the book of Exodus and throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is that God is consistently on the side of the oppressed. Who is doing the oppressing? Almost invariably, it is the, the human governments of the world. We can learn a lot more about what states do and what they uh, always try to do in 1 Samuel 7. 1 Samuel 7 is the point at which Israel is demanding a king. And this is a, and this is a, a very unfortunate situation. God is obviously very displeased with what's going on. Samuel is completely distraught. And what happens when Samuel approaches God to talk to, to God about what, what uh, Israel wants God tells Samuel, the, Isra the Israelites have not rejected you as a judge. They have rejected me. And this is what, this is what Samuel says, actually, in, in, uh, in, chapter, uh, in chapter 1 Samuel 8, starting in verse 6. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them from out, up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will, and they will run in front of his chariots. In other words, he will send them to the front lines and they will die. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. In other words, he will order them what they will do with their profession and what they will do with their lives. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will, make a tenth, he will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and, and attendants. That sounds familiar these days, right? <laughs> your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the Lord will not answer you in that day. Is it not interesting that what he says specifically is they will take a tenth? Now, there's that, that, that joke, if 10% is good enough for Jesus, it ought to be enough for Uncle Sam. But this is actually hearkening back to precisely the command that God gave the Israelites, is that the first tenth, your first fruits, commit to me, and then I will bless you. What this is saying is, in many respects, the king that you are asking for is going to take those first fruits. He is not just stealing from you, he's stealing from me, that being God. If that is not indicting of the state, I don't know what is. Ultimately, states tyrannize their people, and again we see it tries to take the place of God's authority. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about the temptations of Jesus. Now, this is a, a passage that I feel... Very much I've been, in growing even in my own understanding of this particular passage, and I think now that 
The, temp- the second temptation of Christ here for power, actually in many respects, uh, is the summation of all of our own temptations towards power. So let's read this together very briefly. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angel came, angels came and attended him. Um, if we are to believe that Jesus truly came in the flesh and was fully human, and that he was also, as the Scripture says, tempted in every way, then it is entirely consistent to, to say he was tempted with power. And this, these temptations that we read in Matthew chapter 4 and throughout the, the Gospels are really meant to, in, in, in a way, summarize or exemplify the temptations that Jesus faced. This was his, the first recorded temptation for power that he experienced, but it wasn't the only one either. In fact, we read it multiple times that he literally suffers from the, uh, as, as he is trying to reach the Is- Israelite people, but cannot. And he knows that he could. He knows he could force it. He knows that that is possible for him to do. But he, and that is a temptation. I think we actually uh, do not necessarily understand at times how deeply Jesus was tempted throughout the Gospels. But this is, is definitely an exemplary case of his temptation toward power. What this indicates to us also is that this, the kingdoms of the world belong to the Satan. That's the fact. Jesus doesn't reply to Satan with, oh, no, you actually you don't own those kingdoms. That, that's not possible for you to do. In fact, he basically grants him that that is a possibility, that that is something he literally can do, is deliver to him the kingdoms of earth. But he says, no, that's not the purpose of, that is not the purpose of how I am here. That is not the means by which I can accomplish that mission. The kingdoms of earth ultimately are part of, 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 of Satan. Uh, finally, we turn to Revelation as our last example here. In Revelation, we, uh, we experience, a, again, a number of symbols. Now, I think the best way to interpret Revelation is twofold. First is to understand it initially as a prophecy about Rome and about the destruction of Rome and the destruction of Israel in AD 70. But it also holds a, a, a number of symbols that we carry forward and we interpret into our lives today. And that happens in two ways. One is the, the, the battle that we all face against the tyranny of sin over our lives. But it also is representative of the fact that governments are constantly tyrannizing other people. Babylon is representing Rome. Babylon is also representing all governments throughout time as being rebellious against God. What we learn in Revelation is that just as sin's ultimate destiny is destruction, the end destiny of all governments, of all states, is destruction. They will not last. The kingdom of God will prevail. States are destined to, to, be, uh, to just be little footnotes in history, whereas the kingdom of God and what we are doing even here today uh, will last forever. The state's final destination is destruction. So I think now, it's, now is only the time that we can really approach Romans 13 and then take a look at that and see, well, what is really going on here? Instead of looking at Romans 13 first, We should look at it after we look at the context of the rest of Scripture. But let's start a little differently. Instead of starting in Romans 13, 1, let's go one verse before. Actually, let's start two verses before. In Romans 12, verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If if he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against this authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, 
Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. In Romans 13, we, we find some kind of clever words coming from Paul regarding how to interact with the state. But if we take this again out of the context of what we just read in Romans 12 and what we find throughout Scripture regarding the nature of the state and its activity against men, I think we, can, we end up with a slightly different interpretation. Fundamentally, what this is saying is that everybody must submit, yes. Why do we do this? Prudentially. Our goal on earth is not to just tear down a state. We have better things to do in many respects. The gospel, which we are all stewards of, is a much more important aspect of our lives than simply trying to tell off the state. So what do we do instead? We focus, we pick our battles well, but we focus on the gospel. We don't try to in, intentionally put ourselves in situations that will compromise the gospel. We become very careful with how we interact, and we don't try and, uh, and do things that will try and provoke the state to persecute us if we don't have to. But if we are to be persecuted at all, it should only be for the name of Christ and not because I did a little pinprick on the state. So what we find in Romans 13 is not necessarily some theory to justify the state, but a prudential argument for how we are to interact. As I like to tell my students at, or when I was working with the Libertarian Longhorns, I don't need you in, in prison. I don't want to come and get you out. I need you talking with people. I need you interacting with others. I need you to be on the ground teaching people, not just being a gadfly. And I think that's what Romans 13 is essentially telling us as Christians. The state is not outside of God's plan. That's what this says. It's part of, uh, of what God is, is, has, uh, has instituted in the world. Um, but that doesn't justify the fact that it exists. There's, there is no justification for, for initiating violence against other people. This is not an abstract text. Some people like to pull it out of context. But we need to, to take a holistic view of Scripture and look at what, the God, what God says about the state throughout the Bible as we approach this passage. Uh, I am running out of time, so I'm only going to blow through this very quickly. Um, this, this chart here that I put together has, if you can read it all, has a, a lot of information about what I feel is the, kind of the future of building a Christian libertarian edifice of thought, and it involves a number of different things. Uh, I'll, I'll just highlight the main categories that I feel are important for our own uh, understanding of Scripture and, and kind of a, even call it a research program for the future. Uh, first is that we are always trying to build this theological critique of statism and the superiority of the kingdom of God. Our interest is not merely uh, being gadflies, but to have a, a, a real holistic view of what the state is and, and the, the function of the church and society. Uh, from there, we can reinforce a biblical theology of property rights in the free market. Um, we, we understand through our understanding of economics is that the free market is, is the way in which all of us interact peacefully together to build a prosperous society. It is not the state that does that, it is all of us as individuals working together. And this is supported very strongly through Scripture, and I think that, that is a, that's something we need to be constantly aware of. And finally, we, we want to, uh, from there, move towards a biblical theology of personal liberty and freedom to, uh, to make decisions, moral decision-making. And so if you want to learn more about this, I definitely invite you to come and, and visit with me at libertarianchristians.com. And uh, with that, I want to just uh, probably conclude there and give you a few uh, uh, possible questions for discussion. I hope that maybe during our lunch session uh, or our lunch, our lunch together, we might be able to discuss some of these things together. So a few, a few elements for discussion. What challenges do you see uh, to liberty in your church right now? And how can you address those? What strength does your own church tradition have that you can bring forward to, to build this edifice of Christian libertarian thought? We all come from, I mean, we have probably a good 30 different denominations in this room, and I'm really thrilled that we can see that from everyone from Eastern Orthodox to Catholics to a variety of different Protestant traditions. We all bring something to the table, and I hope that in your tradition you will find something that you can teach me about. 
that I, that I didn't know before. And finally, what are some of the ways that you can help move the Christians that you know towards a better understanding of liberty? I hope that this has been useful to you. I hope that in, in some of your notes you will be able to take some of this home and bring these things to mind when you're discussing uh, with your Christian friends and your libertarian friends as to why Christian libertarianism is the most consistent expression of Christian political thought. With that, I invite your questions. We have just a few minutes, and I want to make sure that we're on time for our next speaker. Uh, so thank you very much, and we'll invite your questions now.